Welcome everybody to another episode of Lessons from Leaders. And if you're listening to this in January, they, this is our first podcast of the year 2020. So that is exciting, a new decade, which is hard to get my mind around. And um, I'm so lucky to be here with Detrice Martel Gator, who is the Executive Vice President for Volunteers of America. And I also want to say that she was referred to us by another guest, Shelley Good, who at that time was at Oxfam. And what I do is I ask people, who do you want to hear their leadership stories? You know, you've been a guest, who would you like to hear from? And she said you, Jatrice, which is such an honor that somebody, others want to know, hear from you. So welcome. And to get started, why don't you just give us a little bit of your background so we can think about, we see the beautiful Washington DC area behind you, so we can know how you got here. Well, I am an army brat. I was born in uh, Stuttgart, Germany. I've lived 13 different places, that includes some as an adult. Uh, So I like to move around. I'm a person who admires courage and I've taken a lot of big risk in my life. And uh, my life has been so influenced by my family. My father was the youngest of 18 children, same mother, same father from rural segregated Louisiana. And and my mother also uh, in her younger years lived in public housing in New Orleans. So both of my parents had um, very, very modest beginnings, and they really worked and strove and throughout segregation and humiliation and all kinds of things they had to endure. And their primary goal was to make sure that their children were well-educated and they saw education as a pathway through the kinds of um, discrimination and rigors that uh, we would have to, um, we would have to endure. And, uh, so being very driven, working very hard, I was laughing at myself the other day saying, I can turn anything into hard work. <laughs> so, so working hard, I'm a hard worker. Um, and I have, I'm almost six feet tall. I have a big personality. I like to wear heels. And so um, figuring out how to moderate or accelerate that and when to do it is a big theme throughout my life. Uh, you know, um, I've often been told I'm too much, and um, what does that mean, and too much for whom? And uh, so those are, that's, I think, who I am. Oh, and I'm a big traveler. I love to travel. I've been to all continents except two, and I've got to go to South America and Antarctica to complete that, and I'm planning those trips. And uh, I like to have fun, but I'm also a very hard worker. Thank you. And... um when the, the, what's coming up for me is where I want to go is like the, your leadership journey, which we talked about a little bit the first time we talked and you're touching on it right now, like having the big personality, being a tall African-American woman, how, you know, how did you, I'm thinking of sharp elbows or how, how what is your leadership journey? It wasn't, I think, I remember you telling me it wasn't um, a smooth. Not at all. Without obstacles. Smooth no. sailing without obstacles. But one of the things I had to do was to be willing to move, to move up. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, lived in Indianapolis and I learned a lot there. And I was glad that I learned a lot there. It was a kind community and a kind Midwestern community. I would not have wanted to start and learn and make big mistakes in Washington, D.C. And uh, I it was just a learning opportunity for me to uh, live in Indianapolis. And then I knew that I had to move away in order to get to the next tier. And I was always interested in government relations. So I came to United Way of America as director of uh, federal government relations. And that was wild. It was during the um, first big tax reform movement with uh, Daniel Rostenkowski as chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. And, um, Nonprofits were novices at best at any mm. kind of um, lobbying or um, congressional action. And we were really trying to preserve the charitable tax deduction, which we just got through doing last year. So things go around in circles. But I, I left to Washington, D.C. To, to move to Miami, 
because I knew I wanted to get out of government relations because anywhere you go, it's going to be a small shop with very few people and it's, it's viewed as tangential to the work. So I became um, head of community investment and community relations in um, Miami. And that means that the money that United Way raises, you're in charge of figuring out how to distribute it to the community and what are the biggest needs in the community. And that was amazing. I got to work with people like Janet Reno. But there I had a big, big epiphany when I was in Miami. When I uh, grew up, my parents, as I said, were very uh, driven and very strict. So they were always correcting us and, and fussing at us about something. And that was their way of loving us, of trying to make sure that we were these perfect uh, children and adults. And so I realized, and someone told me that as a um, supervisor, I was always pointing out what was wrong or uh, mm -hmm. I did not celebrate, I did not embrace, I did not um, let people know how well they're doing, how much they are valued. And that was a real learning uh, opportunity for me because um, I equated love with people just uh, kicking your ass all the time, trying to make sure that you're going the right way. And um, I realized that when you work with people, you have to nurture them more and you have to make sure they understand that you appreciate them, that they're doing a good job. And even if they aren't, they can learn to do a better job. Um, I was very proud of myself on Monday. Someone, uh, we found out there was a really big mistake that was ma made. And the person who made it, I said, you know what? It's one mistake. It's the beginning of the year. Uh, we'll live through this. And, um, and she was so apologetic. I said, you know, it's, it's okay. It's okay. You made a mistake. You're human. We'll live through it. And so, um, and I, and even with my own boss, I felt very comfortable with saying, big mistake. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I'm not into the self-flagellation anymore. Right. So that was a big piece. And I, and I think now that as a supervisor, I go out of my way to let people know that they are appreciated, what they don't know. We can get them some classes or workshops so that they can learn it that I'm invested in their career, not just seeing them as a means to an end. And uh, I think I've become a much richer and better supervisor as I've gotten older. Because one thing I find about being a leader is that it's about them, not about you. And that's one of the biggest things for young leaders to understand is that the higher up you go, the less it's about you. It's about how you interact, how you leverage the strengths, how you build relationships, how you make people feel, all of that is so important and how you project out. So I'm so much more cognizant of that and aware of that and intentional about making sure that the people that work with me feel like they have a voice, that they are appreciated and that they are the best at what they do. That's why they're there. And when you say thank you, and when you say it's not about you, it's about them. Yes. What is the you part that you have to give up? The being about me. Oh, I've given up a lot. I mean, this thing about having it all is so not true. Uh, I think the biggest thing in my life has been relationships. Um, I'm unmarried and um, have gone long times without being having a, a, a um, male companion of any kind because um, I always choose work over relationships because I, I believe that's how I support myself and that's how I make myself. And until someone is gonna put a ring on it and, and help me take care of myself, <laughs> they have to be number two. Right. And they don't like that. And uh, yeah, I would say that my working long hours, moving from my career, um, spending weekends and evenings at work events, all of that has truly interfered, and I'm sure that it doesn't have to, and there are ways that women who have five children and a husband do all of this, and, but it hasn't been my journey. My journey is that that is something that has suffered, that is something I have given up, and with the younger women and the millennials and people that I work with, I see that they're not doing that, and I'm so proud of them. Right. They put a line in the sand, I'm sorry, but I can't go to that event on Saturday, I have other plans. It would have never dawned on me to say that to anybody. And I find that being a boomer, I come from the generation where you want to please people, that um, you don't believe that there are alternatives or that you can say no. 
Now, I do say no a lot, and I've learned to say no, but um, if you needed someone to go to an event that night or event that weekend or to fly out of town on a mission um, in two days' notice, it was always me. I would always say, yeah, I can do it. And um, that has, as I am older now, I can see that that has made... um, impact on my life that reverberates even more as I get older because I don't want to be an old lady sitting in a rocking chair thinking about what used to be and I find so many older people talk about the past I want to still keep talking about the future and have hope and a vision that's really important to me there's there's so many things that I want to touch on there and one is that um that Is it that women had to be the way that you were, that I was, to get where we are in that time? Um, And now this space is created for the millennials to be different. Um, That's one of the things that I'm wondering about. And then the other thing, and you can pick which of these you like. The other thing I'm wondering about is as you who you had to be to get to where you are, you know, how, how were you, did you have to, accept, like if you were too much, is that too much that you felt you had to change or was that um, you needed to be too much to get where you are? So they're very different questions, but they're coinciding in my brain. Okay, well, I don't believe I have to change. I remember yeah. one day boss telling me, you're just too much, too much. And I'm like, uh, too much of what? Right. <laughs> too much for you? And what does that mean? And I would push back because this is my personality. And I believe that it has helped me to get where I was. Because I, um, I mean, even simple things. I, I went to a movie with a woman who is a, um, an elected official recently. And the movie started late. It was horrible. Uh, I mean, uh, there were no lights on. It was just a horrible experience, not the movie, but the experience. And so afterwards, I said, I want to speak to the manager. And I said, I want to get new tickets to see the movie again, because our experience was so bad. There were no lights on. And the woman who's an elected politician said, you certainly are aggressive, aren't you? Now, I did not find that to be aggressive. I found that to be uh, a, a sensible, reasonable request that we are compensated for the fact that we had to stumble through our seats and that the movie started half hour late. So I don't give that up. I think someone has to be aggressive and it has made me a good advocate. Mm. The the problem here is I'm a better advocate for other people than I am for myself. And I'm a protector. I was the oldest child. Um, Even in, uh, and I've spoken up with lots of consequences. And the, to the other question, were things different then? Yes, they were question, different. These women nowadays with the Me Too movement, they don't have to go through what we went through. Men were so forward about sexual advances. I'm not even going to say sugarcoat it, sexual advances. And I think maybe because I worked in government relations or in fundraising, and those are rather gr- aggressive um, areas, maybe that's why. But uh, elected officials, um, other nonprofit execs, everyone wanted to see if um, you would succumb to their obvious charms and uh, fall into their arms. Well, actually, no. And I actually found out that you have more power when you say no. <laughs> and you have, oh, oh, that's great. Yes. Way more power. Those women who, that, I, that do make the mistake of flirting back and whatever, they lose their power. And you have power when you say no. I went to a woman when I worked at, uh, in Washington in the 80s, and I said, you know, this man that I have to work with is coming on to me so much, and if I say, if I go to my boss and say, I can't work with him because he's coming on to me, well, then I won't get the other big assignments with other big uh, people working on the Hill. And so I said, so how do I manage this? And she said that, She's had that a lot, and then she says, evidently you like me, and if you like me, you'll stop this, because oh. this is not what I want. Yeah, and yeah so, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, learning to say no and holding your own, because uh, I, 
grew up, my father was an army colonel. He had a lot of army friends. And then I went to law school, which was a male experience. And even in undergrad, um, government and politics was my major. And it was a, another male experience. So I've had a lot of uh, male experiences. And I like men and I get along with them. I have a lot of male friends. And so I did not see the only route to men as being a romantic or sexual uh, endeavor. And I think that that has helped me a lot to uh, put people in their places and to say, that's not even an option <laughs> and kind of laugh it off <laughs> and to evade those kinds of situations. You know, you don't go to anybody's hotel room when you're in a conference, those right. kinds of things. And those were very important things when I was uh, coming up through the, um, 80s and part of the 90s and now then um i'm older i can uh, i know one thing is that, that i tell everybody that um when you want to make a meeting with the men and i have this like take a man to lunch uh every month every month i take a different man to lunch or oh breakfast rather breakfast and i say that you know you want to make a breakfast meeting because men don't feel comfortable going to a dinner meeting with you and they don't some of them don't even want to be seen with you at lunch but i said now that i'm older i'm at the age where they can see have dinner dessert anything with me <laughs> I don't feel at all <laughs> that it would be misinterpreted in any way. But for younger women, I say, ask men to breakfast. Uh, that I think as women, one of the things that we are leaving out in, in the Me Too area is don't forget that men make very good allies. You need to make allies. You need to learn. If they have the power, then we need to talk to them to find out how did they get it? What do they do with it? How are they using it? What do they think about it? How do other people react? Those are the things I want to know. How did you get here? What do you do? And then I find out that the roadmap for them or the path for them is very different for me. Um, very different for me. But I enjoy and I really go out of my way to make sure that I have male colleagues in the same field and that I have a relationship with them beyond a transactional relationship in a meeting. I think that's so important and I love to take, take a man to lunch or breakfast and I don't, and I would beg to, I'm sure that your thing about now that you're however old you are, that people <laughs> don't find you dangerous at dinner, but it's not a good face, dangerous at dinner. <laughs> I love that. Dangerous at dinner. I'm going to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads me to also wonder what else do you know now that you wish you knew then when you were coming up? I actually wish I had been more assertive. Mm. Not I love that. I love that. Please speak about that because my heart is so happy to hear that. <laughs> um, I think that um, working with some of the people that I worked with, I should have uh, been bolder to ask them to breakfast or, mm. or get them better outside of the work and not to be so in awe or intimidated by who they were. I think that um, I, one thing I wish I had done, and I, I do it now, is write more, write op-eds, write articles. They very rarely get published, but it doesn't matter. When they do, it's huge. And therefore, what you're saying is, um, uh, has a place that lives beyond you. Uh, one of my most proudest moments was having an op-ed published in Chronicle of Philanthropy. Mm. I've had a letter to the editor uh, published in The Economist. And those things are just thrilling to me. And believing in my own, not the fact that I'm a hard worker, because so many women say I'm a hard worker. You have to believe I'm smart. I'm strategic. I am vital to the success of this project, this organization. And I, it took me a long time to get there to be able to say that. Yeah. And so... It's believing in yourself and, and what the first two things you said were for me around your voice. Uh, my voice has a right to be heard as in writing articles and all of that and even asking people that you think are beyond you out to breakfast or lunch. I, I matter. Yes. I matter. And even though I'm 20 or 30 or whatever, I have something to say. Um, that's mm -hmm. unique and that is important. That's a, that's a very hard one, I think, especially for women. Because to mm -hmm. our audience, Jatrice and I are both reading a book called How Women Rise, 
again, you should go read this book. And one of the things they talk about in How Women Rise is that women think they don't know enough, they have to learn more, get more information, more experience, and then they will be ready to share their pearls of wisdom. Well, it's and always, we, I've read this before, that men often overestimate their own um, abilities. Like some men, look at the men who are running for president. Um, <laughs> you know, look how uh, Hillary Clinton spent decades in the field getting ready for this, and be, showing that she could be commander in chief, and then she'd been to all these countries, and it wasn't enough. And the men were, a lot of the men who run for president aren't hardly qualified to say, who do you see in the mirror? What mirror are you using? And um, women, we always say, well, I don't have a PhD in this and I haven't spent 10 years on this and so I'm not qualified. Mm-hmm. Most jobs, you learn so much on the job and um, you are qualified because you're willing to do what needs to be done and you have a vision for the future and you have to, uh, we have to think of what, what qualification means for us as women much more differently than the way we do now because we often... Uh, get ourselves out of the competition before it even happens by the bad self-talk and the lack of um, really strong sense of self and accomplishment. And that's hard, you know, especially as an African-American woman, you have people telling you all the time that uh, you're not ready or you're not right or you don't fit in. I remember when I worked for a women's organization, people used to say, well, you, you just think about things so differently or whatever. And I realized that most of the women that I was working with were uh, upper class white women who graduated from the Seven Sisters. And I'm not that person. I have a totally different experience. So therefore it is logical and to be expected that I have a different viewpoint, that I see things differently. And I remember one of the other women telling me about another uh, African-American woman colleague, and I had very few at the time, uh, she said, oh, she sees everything through the lens of color. Well, how else am I supposed to see it? I see it through the lens of my experience, which is 80% because of my color. <laughs> and I have those experiences. And you may be um, a Buddhist or left-handed or have all kinds of things, but I don't see that when you walk into a room. You know, um, when a man walks into a room, if he has on a suit, his hair is combed and he doesn't smell bad, people generally assume that he knows what he's talking about. As a woman, you have to make sure people understand your credentials. I try to make sure everyone understands that I graduated from Syracuse College of Law at University of Maryland, that I worked uh, all over the country. And I don't start off, but this is my resume and I'm qualified, but you kind of work it in and, um, in, in fact, uh, I had a, a really unique experience where the man, and this wasn't a long time ago, this was maybe two or three years ago. A man on, our, on the board where I worked at that time was saying, uh, I really, when I think of, a, of someone who raises money, I think of a man that we used to have at this other organization. He was tall and looked good in a suit and was young and, and vibrant and, and he really did a good job of raising money. So this man was telling me that only a white man in a suit could raise money. And he was saying that to me and another woman, in fact, Michelle, who's another African-American woman. So what I did was that I sent him a copy of my resume and hers. And then I flew her with me to Chicago to meet with him to talk about our qualifications and what did he expect from a uh, a, uh, fundraiser. And I mean, I think he left there impressed, but he did not impress at our credentials, but I'm not sure I changed his idea of what a fundraiser looks like. And um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I just did a uh, panel for the, with, the, uh, with Shelley and some other people in Boston with the uh, Association of Fundraising Professionals about the lack of people of color in fundraising, especially in major donor fundraising, Mm -hmm. where you have to hobnob, uh, charm, and convince the wealthy, sometimes even the one percenters, to uh, believe in your mission and to give you money. And a lot of people feel that as an African-American person or a person of color, that you're not comfortable with them or they're not comfortable with you. And so, um, you know, I've done all kinds of things. You have to have unique strategies in order to 
make it, I think, even as a woman today. For instance, when I lived in Indianapolis, I knew that I wasn't going to go to the um, club and have lunch with the bigwigs in town. And Indianapolis was a very conservative town at that time. And, um, but I joined the Junior League. I helped basically integrate the Junior League because those were the wives of the bigwigs. Mm. They put me in the same circles. And, um, and I learned a lot, you know, through the Junior League. You have one year provisional where you learn a lot of things. And it's, it's certainly changed the model now. It's much more up, up, up to times when women are not just full-time volunteers. We all work. In fact, here in Washington, a lot of the members are from the Hill. But that's, that was a pathway. People said, well, why did you join that? I said, well, how else? Well, how would I be able to meet these movers and shakers who are on the I worked at the United Way at that time, the United Way Board. And the United Way Board was like a major thing in most communities back in the 80s and late 70s. I don't remember. Yeah. And you had really high-ranking bankers, attorneys, builders, who the movers and shakers on those boards. And so I just think that um, when the door is closed to you, go out the window. Find another way. Don't give up. I see people giving up so easily. Well, I tried. How many times did you try? How many ways did you try? Uh, uh, people just give up so easily when they're told no or there's an obstacle in the way. Kick it out of your way. And yeah, people will talk about you. But to me, that's, there's, my father used to say, everybody's not supposed to be your friend. If everybody likes you, that means you stand for nothing. Hmm. It probably also means that you're not stretching, right. which, is a, which is an important point. And so... Um, it's what I'm taking away is one of the things I'm taking away is like a belief I deserve to be here. Your thinking about me does not, I don't believe it. It doesn't change my mindset. I deserve to be here and you know, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to make it happen. So that's the going through the window bit. But I, I think that what I hear people say is well, I tried this and that, it didn't happen, so maybe it's not supposed to be. And you're saying, no, it's, oh. you just haven't found the way yet. Right. Something like that, right? If it's something you want, find a way to get it. Don't give I, up because there are obstacles. There's obstacles in, for, in, in front of you for most things that are worth having. I so love that. <laughs> How can we like sprinkle fairy dust on everyone so they don't, you know, it don't take the environment as your sounding board is i don't know if the environment's the right word but the feedback that you're getting is your sounding board that's not there are obstacles so there always are obstacles and one thing that's important to note is that the obstacles aren't always male i've had a lot of trouble with women in the workplace and especially my uh white female co-workers um who um, have been uh, very, um, you know, we talk about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Inclusion is very important. I've been excluded, I think, more by white women than white men um, in very bold ways. I remember I was in a meeting and some women were uh, getting ready to go to dinner afterwards. And so because I was from the area, they asked me, well, we need a good place to go to dinner. We're all going to dinner. You can come next time. And I'm like, wow. yeah, and I'm like, I just said in my own head, which is I will never go to dinner with you. I don't want to go to dinner with you. Right. Um, and just write them off. I mean, it wasn't a big, I mean, at the time I'm like, I was just um, more amazed at their gall to ask me for the name of a restaurant so that they could all go to dinner and tell me I can come next time. I mean, where do you get off thinking that. So that may seem like a small thing, but all of these things like these microaggressions people talk about, when you talk about them one by one, you say, oh, that's so small. Why would you even think about that? But when it's daily or you have to anticipate it, you have to come with armor prepared to deflect it. You have to make sure that you understand it's not me. It's not me. It's them. Right. And then you, know, then you always sometimes, maybe you did something. You have to be truthful to yourself. Well, I really screwed that up. Let me see what I can do next time. How can I learn to make it better? But as far as charming people and making them like you when they're not disposed to like you, um, they are predisposed to believe that you are inferior um, 
in your education, your uh, IQ, your brain capacity, just because of the color of your skin, but there's nothing you can do about that. And I have to say, I often feel like you feel that way because you are uninformed and ignorant, and I feel sorry for you. So it's, and there's a really a holding on to your own center there, knowing who you are, what you're capable of, and that must um, get tiring sometimes. One of the things that makes me feel, and maybe it's just me, but it makes me feel more comfortable is that um, I'm a saver. I'm good with money. And Mm. I uh, think that more women need to understand as they rise, they need to... um, save their money, plan for the future, and not spend everything on getting their nails done or their hair done or buying a pair of shoes that have red soles on them. That I think it's very important for women to, uh, my hairdresser is a young woman, and uh, 10 years ago I told her, you need to start putting money into your 401k. And then now she's gone out to start her own hairdressing salon, and she told me this week that she's just met with her financial advisor. I mean, I think that part of being secure and part of having options means that if you lost your job tomorrow, you'd still be able to pay your rent or your mortgage. It means that you are saving for when you get old, because even if you're married, women often outlive their husbands, and then one of you may get sick and you eat up, you know, your savings. I I think being smart with money, having a financial advisor, those are things people don't talk about when they talk about women growing and becoming self-confident and rising. You have to be able not only to manage your relationships and your profession, you have to be able to manage your money. I see women dressed up in super expensive clothes who don't have two dimes to rub together and have been working for years. And I don't know how you could let that part of your life go. As women, we have to become much more able. That doesn't mean you give up things. It means that you figure out how to get things on sale or get a deal or barter with someone, all kinds of ways to get things. I am um, so proud of the fact that I just bought a mink coat, full length mink coat for $300. Mm. For $300. Now, I'm the last one to get a mink coat, and most people don't even wear them anymore. But And there's climate change, and it's hot. But it's something I always wanted, because I used to see the movie stars in them when I was very young. And I bought myself one, and it's from a woman who lived in Texas, and it had been in storage for over seven years, and she just wanted to get rid of it. And so now I have one. And every time the weather dips below 30 in Washington, D.C., which is very rarely, I wear it. I wear it with jeans. I wear it to the grocery store. Because it's something I wanted when I was a little girl. Because all the glamorous women on television and then the movies had them. And part of the point of your story is you did things to get to this point that you could get uh, a mink coat at a good a, a price that was... You didn't get it when you were 25 and you really wanted it. So Yeah. yeah. Right. And, you know, maybe I'm a little late. I didn't have one earlier like all my friends did. But... Um, I just see the way people that I know spend money on minks and jewelry and shoes that have red bottoms on it. And I'm like, oh no, part of being successful means that you are in control of your finances, that you have planned for your future. And, uh, and so I always encourage younger women, are you putting the max in your 403B? Do you have, uh, you know, you need to do that now. And I'm so proud of my hairstylist for uh, doing that. Yeah. I'm so proud of her. So I wanted, because I'm watching the time, and I wanted to switch gears on you, if you would. Um, we talked about failure, which we had a great conversation about before. And the question was, what do you think about failure? And um, what are some failures and what you learn from them? And we've touched on some of that, but I wondered if we could just mine the depths of your experience again. And what do you think about failure? Well, I have failed at failure because mm-hmm. I, I ruminate, self-flagellate, think about it for months, think about it at night, write it in my, um, my uh, journal. I write about it. I mean, it just, it just stings. It's like a, a scar that won't go away. And believe me, I've had my failures. And... Um, 
but now I think that as I get older, I'm trying to, to learn how, okay, yeah, I failed. Like I was so proud of myself on Monday. We failed at something. We made a big mistake. Okay, we made a big mistake. This is 2020, it's a new year. We're fine. We'll fix that. Nobody's going to die from this. And um, forgiving yourself. I think forgiving yourself is one of the hardest things to do. I think so. Uh, yeah, and I'm so afraid of failure that I over-prepare. If I'm giving a presentation or something, I over-prepare because I said, this presentation may be bad, I may be awful, but it's not going to be because I didn't do my homework. It won't be because I didn't do my homework. I will do my homework. So the fear of failure um, causes me to be prepared and um, not wanting to go through what happens when I make a big failure, all that pain, I mean, physical pain. In fact, I was reading something in Psychology Today about how Tylenol can help with uh, mental pain sometimes because the pain is as bad as physical pain. And um, when you're hurting, sometimes you can take a Tylenol. <laughs> so, and I was going through something at the time and I took Tylenol every day. <laughs> but um, failure is a part of life. It's who we are. The key, you know, now everybody talks about resilience. That's the key. And, mm -hmm. and the key in resilience is to be able to forgive yourself. Forgive right. yourself to how you think about yourself. You have to forgive yourself. Yes, I made a mistake. What did I learn from it? I always try to figure out what did I learn from this? How did this happen? And so, um, you know, being a perfectionist is holds so many women back. And uh, I had a boss one time. He said, Jatrice, everything doesn't have to be perfect. Sometimes you have to make a C and get it done. And I'm not sure that's what you want to live by, but I have learned that sometimes there are things that just have to get done. And then there's some things you want them to be as close to perfect as possible. But failure is going to happen to you. How will you manage it? How will you that's get it? It's going to happen. I, I like that reminder. And one of my new current favorite sayings is um, that, well, it's not really a saying, but we play not to fail. We play to not to fail. So not that we play safe. We play, we're, we're playing in a little area because we're trying not to fail. That's what it is. And I think what I've been thinking about is that that keeps us not reaching. And what I love about your story is I don't know if you were playing not to fail, but you have played your space is big. You've made space for who you are, how you show up. People have implicitly or, ex, what's the other one? Implicit or not implicit? Have <laughs> try, tried to keep you, you know, to be small while I was telling you too much and you haven't accepted that. No, I don't. So that's, that's one of the things I was so excited about your story and your journey. And just to go back, do you feel like you play big or do you try to play not to fail? Oh, I play big. I take yeah, that's what I thought. So that, now you're going to make me cry again. I'm getting to that point. <laughs> <laughs> I take risks. I, you know, life is short. And I tell my younger friends, life is short. If you're afraid to take a risk now, I moved to Miami not knowing anyone. No one mm -hmm. knows. No one in, on the East Coast, under Washington and New York, know a lot of people well, in Washington, know a lot of people in Miami. So I went there with no contacts, no list of other people's friends. And uh, because the job was good, I wanted to, I had never lived in Miami. It was like a very unique place to live. And I lived on Miami Beach for four years. And um, I had incredible experiences. But moving there without knowing anyone, when you move into um, towns that have smaller uh, central cores, people are suspicious of you when you first come. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, and then moving, uh, I moved to Michigan, uh, lived in East Lansing, I think, which had a African American population of 0.2%. Uh, and I when moved, you moved there, it became 0.5 or... Right, right. <laughs> I did something absolutely crazy. Uh, I moved from Miami to East Lansing to one of the snowiest, grayest wow. places in the country. And uh, that was quite a uh, stretch. But I, I got to work with, um, um, on the board where I worked, there was Fisher, Max Fisher from Body by Fisher. Mm. There was um, Al Taubman, who was a billionaire at the time. I mean, just interesting people that I got to know. 
And then I was working on um, g going to Flint and, and working with young kids and seeing where they had to walk to school while I was afraid to walk as an adult. And I really got to um, talk about, look at both sides of a vast inequality imbalance. Mm. So every place I've lived, I've enjoyed it. I've uh, learned something about it. And, um, and in most of those places I knew it was not forever. But here in Washington, this is my forever home. I love Washington. And um, they say that, uh, I have a sign in my office that says, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. <laughs> because, because friendships are so transactional and positional. And, um, and you know that. But the things that you can do, you can actually make a difference in policy. You can actually be with people who are advocating to change laws, to bring justice to more people. It's just an amazing opportunity, but it's not for the weak of heart. And you have to walk into the room loving yourself because people will try to pull a piece out of you all the time. You can live through it. Um, and it hasn't been easy. I've been lonely. I've been alone. I've cried. I have just felt pain deep in my soul. But it didn't kill me. You can't see that on my face. And uh, I worked through it. I pushed through it. I'm here today and tomorrow. Do you think those things help you be your kick-ass self you are today? All those, they, they... Another thing that's important that made me do that is that I understand my own mortality. My mother died when she was 37, beautiful, oh my and I was 17. My father died when he was 73. And so having my mother die early lets me know that this is not forever. There are no consequences bigger than death. Death is the ultimate consequences. Consequence. So if it didn't kill you, you can get over it. Mm. Push back. And on my little time on Earth, when I have a small window in which I can make a difference and and uh, use the opportunity to make lives different for people that come behind me or who are not me, well then you're not going to get in my way. And understanding my own mortality and understanding the biggest thing that I value and cherish is my life, and I know it's going to end. And you're not going to disturb my value while I'm here, alive and vibrant and able to contribute and make a difference. I love that. I'm, I'm very sorry that that's going to have to be where we're ending because I could keep going on that. And I, what I hope people, and I'm sure they're taking away, is that strength of this is my value. I'm bringing it. This is my time to do it. And... Um, I'm going to stand here and do that. So, and I'll you. <laughs> yes. And yeah, I'm so humbled by having you here as a guest. Thank you so much for spending time with us Thank and sharing you so your wisdom. For hearing me. Thank you. I appreciate you. Okay. Thanks, Uchis. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.